Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. In this video, I'm continuing a, a series that's to do with the Diet of Worms. Now, what was the Diet of Worms? It's a good question. The Diet of Worms is one of those great events in church history, and as one, one friend commented, uh, jokingly, of course, that it sounds to some extent a bit like the sort of challenge that you might find on a television programme. Of course, the the word diet here means assembly or parliament, and Worms is a German city. The Holy Roman Empire, the Empire of the Germans, as it was otherwise known, had... It's an unusual system, really, because the Holy Roman Empire wasn't a, a centralised state the way that most modern countries are. It was rather a fairly loose, in some respects, agglomeration of individual states that owed some sort of ultimate allegiance to the person of the Holy Roman Emperor. It didn't have a parliament in the way that the the UK has a parliament. It had what was called the, the Diet or the Reichstag, um, of course the German, Reichstag, and although Reichstag later comes to be used in federal Germany, in the German Empire, the Second Reich as it's known, and for the Parliament, yet in reality it's a very different thing from the, the the Imperial Diet. The Imperial Diet was not a legislative body, it didn't pass legislation the way Parliaments do. Rather, the Imperial Diet was a deliberative body, it was where the, the leaders of the various nations that made up the Empire came together to meet, to discuss, to talk over various matters affecting them. And in 1521, spring of 1521, the Diet met in the imperial city of Worms. And on the agenda, among other things, was Martin Luther. Martin Luther had gone from strength to strength. We, we tend to mark Reformation Day as the 31st of October, 1517. But it's very easy for us, looking back, to overestimate the importance of that day in the minds of the people there, and particularly in Martin Luther's mind. The last thing on Martin Luther's mind when he went to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg was starting a revolution, or even starting a reformation. Instead, he was a man, a professor, who was offended by what he saw as the abuse of the teachings of the medieval Catholic Church. The teaching of penance, and particularly the idea that you could buy an indulgence, a certificate, that is, that said that you got time off purgatory for effectively paying money to the church. He was offended by the church using this very real part of the disciplinary system, I suppose we might say, of the church as a way not to help people to grow, but as a way to make money. Luther was a very serious man with a very serious concern for sin and a very serious concern for the consequences of sin, and he saw the system of indulgences as something that made light of sin, at least the way that it was being presented by the indulgence cell. And this is the other thing to remember that Tetzel, when he said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, he wasn't echoing, he wasn't passing on or teaching official church dogma. He was 
an unscrupulous salesman trying to get a sale. He was a man trying to raise money and he was not above abusing his position to do it. And so Luther comes along and Luther is effectively saying, we need to deal with this. Now, the interesting thing is that Martin Luther, he's not interested in changing the doctrine of the church. Certainly, in his own mind, that's not what he's thinking about. Nevertheless, Martin Luther has a doctrinal mind. And so he doesn't just say, well, look, these, these abuses need to be dealt with. He says, we need to deal with the doctrine, with the teaching, the idea that the Pope has the the power to forgive sins if you pay him. This is a problem. And so there are, there's a doctrinal element at that Reformation Day. That's why we mark the 31st of October as a Reformation Day. However, a much more significant day comes three years later. 1518, 1519, 1520. The Pope issues a ball condemning Martin Luther, declaring that Martin Luther must repent or he will be excommunicate. And this power of excommunication, to us today, to most people today, it seems ludicrous that the Pope should have regarded the ability to exclude someone from the Church as something that would terrify even the rulers of Christendom. But you see, the Pope's power wasn't just to say you're no longer a member of the Church, it was the power to say you are excluded from society. Remember in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, to be a member of society and to be a member of the Church were more or less the same thing. Yes, there were special dispensations, for example, for Jews. Jews were allowed to be Jewish, at least in places where they were allowed to exist at all. They were allowed to not be Christians, not be Catholics, and yet they were subject also to a great deal in the way of civil penalties, civil disabilities. In other words, the Jews were an exception. But if you were a, a Catholic, a Christian, and you were excommunicate, then essentially you were on your own. It was like being an outlaw. Anyone could kill you. And particularly for a ruler, this was extremely worrying. But it was terrifying also for the common man. But what does Martin Luther do on that day, late in 1520? He goes out outside the walls of Wittenberg and he burns the Pope's bull. He also managed to get volumes of the canon law, the law of the Catholic Church, and he burned them as well. And by doing so, Luther is saying, I defy the Pope. I do not recognise his ability to shut me out of the Church. And by joining him, the people of Wittenberg are saying, we agree with him. And by doing that, what they have done is they have broken the power of the papacy at least as far as they're concerned, as far as Wittenberg and Saxony is concerned. And this then leads to a crisis. Now, the Emperor Charles V has only recently come to the throne. He's a, a new emperor. And the Roman Holy Roman Empire, as I've mentioned in an earlier video on Charles, the Holy Roman Empire is an interesting body because the Holy Roman Empire is elective. And that means that Charles doesn't owe his position so much, certainly owe it simply to the fact that he is the grandson of the last emperor, Maximilian I. Rather, Charles owes the electors, the German princes who have voted for him. And one of those princes is the elector Frederick of Saxony, who was Luther's supporter. Now, the Pope says, basically, look, I've, I've issued the bull, Luther has burned the bull, Luther's excommunicate. What you have to do at the imperial diet is you simply have to say, Luther's excommunicate, we have nothing to do with him. But Charles can't do that because Charles has to think of the voters. 
This is why an electoral system is so useful. It means that the government, if it's one man answerable to these princes, or if it's a lot of men answerable to a general electorate, the government is answerable to the voters. And it's not just, if you think about the Holy Roman Empire, you're elected for life. Well, doesn't that mean that he can do what he likes? No, it doesn't, because he's dependent on these men for paying taxes, for supporting him with projects that he wants to do, with wars that he wants to fight. So Charles sa says, look, I'm going to have to listen to, to these people. And he summons Luther to Worms to appear before the Diet and to give an account. Now, Aleander, the papal representative, says, look, don't let him speak. What you have to do is we have to set it up so that Luther is just told, recant, change your position, give up what you've said, submit to the papacy, and you're fine. But don't let Luther give a sermon. Don't let Luther give a speech. But at the same time, Charles says, look, I've got to let there be at least be the appearance of a trial. And Aleander says, look, don't do that. Because Aleander has an understanding that Luther is a very clever man. And Luther is going to find a way to make even a Stalin-style show trial, I know I'm being anachronistic there, but even to make a Stalin-type show trial into an opportunity for him to actually say his piece, to explain his position. Well, what happens is that Luther arrives on the 16th of April, and he's had this, this great triumphal procession from Wittenberg. And every great town, every town he's visited, he's been allowed to go and to preach, and to speak the gospel, to explain, this is why I'm going to Vorms because of my teaching about the forgiveness of sins, because of my teaching about the supremacy, not of the Pope, but of Christ and his scriptures. And, in fact, to the point where he gives himself a breakdown, he arrives at Worms rather under the weather, which, of course, as far as the paper of Angela is concerned, this is a good thing. Now, he arrives at Worms also to find that the people really love him. They're cheering for him. Luther's books are being sold on carts on the street. He's given accommodation in the house of the Knights of St. John. He has lordly accommodation. He's literally staying in the same house as the Chancellor of the Holy Roman Empire. On the other hand, Aleander has a miserable little unheated attic room, because that's the only thing anyone's willing to rent to him. So Aleander knows, look, they don't like the Pope here at the moment. They like Luther. Luther's able to dine with the good and the great. However, there's a hearing to be held on the 17th. And on the 17th, Martin Luther, late in the day, he's brought into the Diet. And they have to take him through a back garden, because there's so many people in the street wanting, we want to see Luther. And even the garden people craning out windows, look, we can see Luther, there's Luther. And he arrives. And there's a pile of his books on a table. All the books he's written. And Aleander's not there. Aleander has basically just given up and he's gone to a, a man called... Well, he's only known as Eck, but he's not the same as the other Eck. So in a recent article I've referred to him as von der Eckem. Um, and Ekem says, look, are these your books? Because Ekem has set it up, he thinks, I can get Luther to give just yes or no answer. I'm going to ask questions where it's a yes or a no. So Luther can't give a speech. Luther can't do grandstanding. He says, are they your books? The title is read out. And Luther says, yes, they're my books. Do you recant what you say in them. And at this point, Ekin has made a mistake. Because Luther says, let me think about it. He says, look, I've written so many books, and you've just jumped this question to me. Now, I need time to think. And Ekin is looking at the emperor, 
don't, don't, don't. And the Emperor says, absolutely. Go and think about it overnight and come back tomorrow. And at that point, Ekin knows, or should have known, we've lost. Aliana definitely knew we've lost. Because what we want is we don't want Luther talking. And Luther gets to talk. And the following evening, Ekin gets more and more annoyed speaking to Luther. Give an answer, give an answer. And then Luther gives the famous answer. Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships require a simple answer. I will give you one without horns and without teeth in these words. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or by evident reason, for I put my faith neither in popes nor councils alone, since it's established that they have erred again and again and contradicted one another. I am bound by scriptural evidence adduced by me, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, I will not recant anything, for it is neither safe nor right to act against one's conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And that, of course, is the famous speech. My conscience is captive to the word of God. And you will notice that Luther is not playing politics here. Luther is not concerned with politics. Luther is concerned here with the simple fact of the word of God. The great importance of the Diet of Worms is here we have one man, a theology professor, standing before the highest authority in the German Empire and saying, I cannot conform my conscience to your dictates. I, and von, von Ecken is so annoyed at this, eventually he says, damn your conscience, forget about your conscience. And of course, at this point, von der Ecken has lost. If he's saying, damn your conscience, and Martin Luther is saying, I stand by my conscience. But you will notice also, when Luther talks about conscience, he's talking about this capacity of self-knowledge. He's talking about our moral compass, the, the core of the man. And the conscience can be mistaken. And that's why Luther doesn't say, look, my conscience is bound, therefore I, I'm never going to change. Luther says, no, change my mind. Change my mind from scripture. Change my mind by reasoning from the scriptures. All along, this was the problem with the way that the representatives of the Roman Catholic Church or the medieval Catholic Church treated Luther. All along, they basically said, look, never mind your conscience, just do what we tell you. And all along, Luther is, no, I, I have to mind my conscience, because my conscience is key. And also, he says, look, it's not enough for you to tell me you have to believe this. You have to show me from Scripture what to believe. And this is the significance of Worms, really. Just as the significance of the burning of the papal bull is saying... I'm not afraid of the, the Pope's threats. I don't believe the Pope had this spiritual power to cast me out of the kingdom. So Vaughan says, look, I need scripture. And all along he said, I need scripture. And Vaughan says that, here I stand. It is that great crisis moment. That moment when there is this monk who is still suffering the after effects of too much travel and uh, being entertained by far too many rich German burgomasters and had an awful upset stomach. This tall, thin man, very pale, standing before the assembled great and good of the empire. And he says, here I stand. I cannot recant because what I'm subject to isn't the papacy. It isn't the empire. It's the word of God. And it's for that reason that the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Worms means something. It's for that reason that we are concerned to celebrate it this year. Because, not because it's someone being a member of the Awkward Squad, um, but because it is a significant witness to the reality that 
the word of God is what binds our consciences. Luther understood that someone can have a completely misinformed conscience. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, look, you can have a conscience that's completely wrong, but it is never safe to go against the conscience. So that if Luther is wrong, then the right approach for the Catholic Church would have been to go, well, OK, Luther, here's why you're wrong. Instead, they just go, recant, recant, recant. We have authority. Who do you think you are? And Luther says, I think I'm a man standing before God who must give account to God. Here I stand. I can do no other. And that's why, in many ways, really, of all the, the many 500th anniversaries of things associated with the Reformation that we have, going on at the moment that we've been celebrating since fifteen seven since 2017. In some ways, I think, in many ways, this is the most important. Luther at the Diet of Worms. And that's, that's why we celebrate this. And it's not just that we're celebrating a man who was brave and noble, but a man who was right. Here I stand on the word of God, and here we stand. And by celebrating Luther the Diet of Worms, what we're really doing is we're saying, we too take our stand upon the word of God and we will not be uh, terrified by being ordered to recant unless we are convinced by the word of God and, and sound reason based upon that word. Here we stand, we can do no otherwise. May God help us. Amen.